Okay. Um, I am really delighted to introduce Dr. Amber Namlar to come back again. Amber has been working on a gene study therapy through the University of Pittsburgh for a while now and has recently studied, started another study that is showing promise. So we'd like to invite her now to come up, put on the headset, and tell you more about that program. Let's see. All right, hello everyone. Um, I'm really excited to have a chance uh, to talk to you today about uh, a, a gene therapy study that I've been working on. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity for many years to work with patients and, um, you know, as a movement disorder specialist. And, you know, I think there was a point where I was very frustrated handing out lots of cinnamon and wanted to do something a little bit different. And I had an opportunity to do something very transformative with, with this uh, study. And so I hope you also think that today, too. And I, I think it's also really important, and I probably don't need to point this out, but you're not alone. This is a very common disease. And I think that's part of what I think a lot of people are so frustrated for something that's so common. Why has it been so difficult? to treat. I, I also want to give a special call out to all my young patients. You know, I think they often get left aside in these discussions and to keep in mind that about 4% of patients with, with Parkinson's are diagnosed before the age of 50 and, you know, to keep in mind that this is not just a, um, an old person's disease. And I think the economic impacts of Parkinson's are often, you know, felt in different ways by the patient. But when you start putting all of this information together, you know, there's, you know, Parkinson's is more common than ALS, multiple sclerosis um, put together. And just to give you an idea of, of how, how big this, this problem is and how important it is that we continue to do research to start making a big difference on, on Parkinson's and, and how people are experiencing this. And so what we are doing and what a lot of my work has been on for the past several years is actually gene therapy um, for, for PD. And I get asked a lot, so what is gene therapy? What does that mean? And I found that it's been a lot easier for people to understand this if I try and explain it as if I was trying to talk to my, my mother about this. So what really needs to happen here is we need to make sure we're speaking the same language. And so what you see here is DNA. I think a lot of people may recognize the, um, the double helix here. And um, it, we all have DNA. DNA in our body and our DNA is made up of lots of genes. And so um, we have our gene here. Um, and uh, it's one thing to have a gene. We know exactly which one we want, but in order to be able to get this into the cells that we want, we need a way of packaging this. And we do this by packaging into um, a vector. So this is serving as like our, our envelope. Um, with the, through um, just uh, techniques, we're able to get the gene packaged into our, our vector, and then we need to get the vector into, in our case, into the brain. Uh, when we do that, um, the vector using its own natural ability to get inside cells, which we know they're really good at, um, it gets inside, and that, that packaging just goes away. It doesn't stay behind, and all that's left there is the, our gene, our little piece of DNA. And then the cell does exactly what the cell does when it reads a piece of, of DNA. These are instructions, and it reads instructions. And in this case, what we're asking the cell to do is make more of GDNF. GDNF is a, a growth factor that all of our cells um, have, and it's required for the growth and development specifically of the dopamine cells. So I'm going forward from here, I'm gonna be talking about GDNF, it's gonna be in, in green here. Um, and again, GDNF is a, a growth factor, it's a, a protective uh, factor as well for um, dopamine cells. Um, and also going forward, I'm using dopamine in yellow to keep that in mind. So this is the chemical that we all use in our brains to help uh, with movement. And this is what's affected in Parkinson's patients and causes, when it's low, it causes people to have tremor, stiffness and shaking. So I think uh, it helps if we kind of understand the, the map here. So if I were to slice you perfectly in half, this is what the brain would look like from the side. And I think most people are familiar with the cortex. So this is the thinking part of the brain. But for Parkinson's, the parts that I'm more concerned with are the substantia nigra. This is where the cell bodies live. And then they send their projections, their little branches up to the putamen up here. 
Um, when we are talking about doing gene therapy for Parkinson's, um, we're talking about really um, going here in the putamen. When we're young, um, we have a lot of GDNF, so here in the green, and that's what helps support the growth and the development of the dopaminergic system. And you get a lot of these uh, branchings that, that um, then occur, and you get these highways, and this is where the, the dopamine travels down. And um, as we uh, get older, we don't need quite as much GDNF. All those tracks are now established and um, they're doing well. When we move into adulthood, we see that there's a natural decline of GDNF. And you can see here, there's just not as much there and we don't need it, the cells are there. We just need a little bit of GDNF for maintenance of, of the system. But there are some people who are destined to go on to have Parkinson's. And in these cases, we've seen that they have a lot less GDNF. And we think that without as much GDNF, we just don't have as many of these branches. The system just can't maintain all the, the tracks and highways. And this means that you're not getting as many of the connections. Um, but we call this the premotor stage, meaning that these are a stage when patients aren't really feeling it just yet. They're able to adapt and accommodate over time. But then at some point, patients will cross this threshold, and it's different for everybody. But the thought is that there's now almost no um, GDNF that's here, and it's just you lose a lot of the terminals and branches that are in the putamen. Now, again, you've lost the ability to make um, dopamine as well. The turnover is not there, and now you don't have the highways to deliver it down to the putamen. And this is what results in the shaking, stiffness, and slowing that we see in Parkinson's disease. What we're proposing to do with our gene therapy is um, to, uh, you'll see here in a second, um, actually inject right into the putamen. We deliver our package with uh, our gene of interest. The packaging goes away, gets taken up by the body, and now all we have is the DNA that's inside the cells. And now we're asking cells, I know you're making GDNF already, I want you to make a lot more. And so you can see here, the GDNF, it takes a little bit of time, but the GDNF comes up and we have evidence from both early primate studies and as well as an early study with this drug at NIH. Um, there's a lot of hints that suggest that this causes what few um, terminals and branches are still there, uh, that this will actually cause them to grow back and, and what we call sprouting. And again, with, with the healthier just entire system, the thought is that this will also help with transmission of dopamine. And it's the combination of more ch channels and highways of getting dopamine down there and better ability to make dopamine. That's what should relieve the symptoms of Parkinson's and that's what we're gonna be looking for. So the, I, the big deal with gene therapy here is that this is, should be a one-time therapy. The, this is, um, and we're hoping for a one-time therapy that will help protect the brain against the ravages of, of Parkinson's. And there's a lot of reasons why it took us a long time to get here. Um, and, you know, one issue is a lot of efforts have been going into improving the treatments that are there. Um, it's taken a long time to figure out how to do gene therapy, how to do it for the brain, and how to do it for Parkinson's. And I'll, I hope to show you where all that came into play. And there's a lot of um, issues with just trying to get clinical trials up and running to develop these new medicines. It's it's very difficult process to do. So I'm going to first mention, I don't need to tell any of you here, but um, most of our treatments here are really just to treat symptoms. They're not um, actually affecting the disease itself. So between a lot of the medications, and there's a lot of novel therapies out there that some of you probably have or have had, you know, including the focus ultrasound and DBS, but these are measures that can be very helpful and make a big difference in a lot of people's lives. But at the end of the day, they actually don't do anything to alter the disease course. And that's really um, where I think we can make a big difference. Um, and again, it's, it, I, I think it's really helpful to know, you know, what is gene therapy and what is not gene therapy. And I think a lot of patients get things um, confused. This is a newer technology. And so I think it's important to point out that this is not modifying your genes. We're not doing anything like that. This is also not human cloning. And we're also not making designer babies. This is not at all what we're doing. In fact, we're just making extra copies of a gene that you already have in your brain and asking your cells to make more of the, the GDNF. And, but to get to the point where we can do this now with, with patients in this trial, it's taken a long time to get here. And so I think just now, really, we finally have the right drug with GDNF. We have the right delivery system, the packaging, and we're using a vector called AAV. And we also have the right delivery system or the, the right administration process to give very precise injections in only the parts of the brain that we want.
So let me tell you just a bit more about the GDNF. So again, this is um, a, a, the gene for GDNF, and we have this, uh, and this is what we package into our vector. This is uh, already naturally occurring in, in all human brains, and again, is required actually for the development of the dopaminergic system, um, and is needed in small amounts at least to maintain the, the health of dopamine cells in, in the adult brain. Um, and we're using a man-made copy of, of GDNF that um, is, matches what is already there in your brain cells. Um, now we needed a better way to package it. This actually took a long time to figure out what was the best packaging material. And this is, it depends on what part of the, the body you're trying to do gene therapy on. In this case, we found that um, AAV and specifically AAV2 is, is perfect for getting into neurons and not all parts of the brain. And it stays really where we put it. It doesn't go all over the place. Um, and then really the key thing here and what um, we're trying to do with our company Brain Neurotherapy Bio is really precisely injecting this into the brain. So we have um, uh, our surgeries all done in the MRI. This is actually um, a picture of our now former neurosurgeon, Dr. Richardson, and doing um, actually a DBS surgery here in the MRI machine. So the patient is in here and we can operate directly on the patient in the MRI suite. The benefit here is that we use MRI to guide our surgery. And so we can see exactly where we are in the brain and where our vector is going at all times and can make changes and adjustments so that we can infuse just that putamen and every infusion is tailored to each individual um, person's anatomy. This is one-time surgery. There's no coming back for um, battery placement or replacement. This is a one-time deal, so we take it very seriously and take our time. Another benefit for a lot of patients is that this is all done asleep. Um, it's in the MRI machine, and um, you know, this is always hard for the, the families that, that are sitting in the waiting room, and the patient's usually asleep, but um, there's an advantage of not having the stress of being awake for surgery. Um, I think this is really surprising to a lot of people when, when they hear me say this, but um, we have one day of surgery and there's maybe one or two days of recovery in the hospital. Um, because there's no hardware, there's nothing that's implanted or left behind except for our study drug, um, I think that it really helps advance the recovery in the hospital and patients are usually out the next day um, and uh, do fairly well. Um, again, the, the big deal here and what we're really hoping to see is we expect that uh, GDNF gene therapy will actually alter the disease course and not no longer just treat the symptoms. And this is really the goal of what we're trying to figure out with, with this current study. Um, just a little bit about the, our new company. So it's Brain Neurotherapy Bio. So this was founded by uh, Dr. Chris Bankovich, who uh, really pioneered uh, the technology that you see here today. Um, and really the focus is on specifically on trying to do disease modifying therapies for brain disorders. And again, I, I, I think I need to emphasize, it took decades to get to this point where we had all the right pieces in place and we're just now finally there. And it's really exciting to have a chance to make this a reality for patients. Um, I just, uh, one last thing on the clinical trials, you know, there's uh, over 60% of patients with Parkinson's disease, and I'm sure the audience is probably no different here. Um, most 60% would say, yeah, I'll participate in research. But in reality, it's only about 10% of patients actually sign up for trials. And so, you know, that actually really can slow things down for, for progress. Um, and I just want to mention that this has already been looked at at the NIH. There was an early phase one study that was started in um, 2013. Um, there's, um, and again, using all the same pieces that I discussed earlier, but in a lower dose and, and more advanced patients. And what we're trying to do now is retool this and use a higher dose and looking in both earlier and later patients um, to see if, if one group benefits more than another. Uh, right now, this study is open and recruiting at Ohio State and Columbia. Columbus, Ohio. Um, what you see here is uh, uh, an email. So it's the OSU Gene Therapy Research um, at osumc.edu. I'm sure we can get that email address to you if you would like to get more information, but you can feel free to reach out to them if you have any interest or want to more information. Um, just as a just a quick um, uh, reminder of what we're looking for, so we need someone that has Parkinson's disease and not something else. Um, looking at age ranges 35 to 75 and without um, severe problems with dyskinesias or depression and DBS would be disqualifying as well. There's a lot more that goes into this, but um, these are usually the ones that people ask me the most. 
um, you know, if you do find that you're interested and eligible for the study, it's it's a big study and takes a, it's very intensive. Um, this is a one-time surgery, and it, but it does require a commitment to about five years um, of visits coming in to see um, our study neurologists. We're trying to make some of this virtual and in, in um, to response to the COVID, um, but um, it's still very intense. Um, but this does involve a lot of close neurologic monitoring and the ability to give back to the research community um, in a way that only you can. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we have the trials listed on both clinicaltrials.gov. You can see our, the number here. We're also on the Fox Trial Finder. You feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to direct you or answer any questions you might have about gene therapy as well. Um, for anyone who's on right now that has participated in research, a just a special thank you to you. Um, this wouldn't be possible without you. And I would just ask you, you know, please think about being part of 10% and join the fight. Help us, help us beat down Parkinson's. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Van Lahr. Um, just a quick question yeah. from one of the uh, attendees. Um, is uh, dementia uh, disqualification for eligibility? We will screen for it. So um, it depends on how severe it is. Okay. And um, the, the follow-up to that is, um, would there be any uh, impact on cognition as a result of the procedure? We're looking. We, and I think the short answer is we're, we haven't seen anything dramatic yet, but we're watching because we don't know. This is all an experiment. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much.